engineering the launch vehicles that allowed America to achieve suborbital flight and eventually land on the moon was no easy task. The team of Project Mercury struggled for months, trying to combine military and aviation technology, facing issues that had never been dealt with before. When the Mercury Redstone 1 launch failed, the engineers from Project Mercury stood in silence, astounded. The rocket only made a four-inch flight. They had designed the launch for months, but nothing had gone according to plan. Instead, they were left with a fully-fueled rocket at risk of exploding. The failure was incredibly demoralizing, since the team had been fending off critics for months, who believed the United States would never rise to the level of the Soviet Union during the space race. However, failure has been a crucial part of the learning process for American spaceflight programs. The most important lesson learned by the engineers after the failure of the Mercury Redstone 1 is that spaceflight is a hard-fought game of inches. Project Mercury was the first of the U.S.'s crewed spaceflight programs. The project sought to send a man to space and back to Earth, preferably before the Soviet Union achieved the same feat. For the program, McDonnell Aircraft produced the Mercury space capsule, which would carry enough supplies for a pilot to survive a day in space. But one of the big questions at the time was how to boost such a capsule into suborbital flight. To achieve such a feat, NASA first experimented with the Atlas D ICBM, which at the time was considered one of the largest rockets produced in the United States. On September 8, 1959, a modified 55-foot-long Atlas dubbed Big Joe successfully launched the space capsule, albeit with multiple issues. This launch vehicle couldn't change direction and merely followed the path from the angle at which it was launched. On July 28, 1960, the program conducted a test flight with the new Mercury Atlas I, which intended to launch the capsule into space. However, the vehicle disintegrated during ascent. The problems registered with the Atlas during the test flights weren't easy to solve. Therefore, NASA turned its attention to the Redstone, the oldest liquid-fuel ballistic missile belonging to the U.S. Army. This rocket was built by Chrysler and developed by the Army Ballistic Missile Agency in Huntsville, Alabama in 1953. The Mercury Redstone launch vehicle, a quarter of the Atlas's size, would be used for conducting 15-minute suborbital test flights. These tests preceded the human crewed orbital flights and were meant to evaluate the astronaut's experience during its weightlessness periods. However, the 75,000 pounds force of thrust generated by alcohol and liquid oxygen combustion wasn't enough for the missile to operate in orbital missions. This issue was solved thanks to research vehicle Jupiter-C, which carried a redstone and two solid propellant upper stages. Thanks to its new lengthened tanks, the rocket could finally carry all the propellant necessary for suborbital flight. Since the Jupiter C's engine was being gradually disposed of by the Army, the Mercury Redstone was modified with a Rocketdyne A7 engine and used safer fuel consisting of ethanol mixture and liquid oxygen. To guarantee that the vehicle would safely support crewed flights, the Redstone underwent over 800 additional modifications. Because the mission and scope were so new, the team from Project Mercury was in uncharted territory. Former fighter pilot Gene Krantz and the NASA engineers ran several of the initial tests to experiment with the mix of rocket and aviation technology they were pairing. For the tests, they used a box of electronics to simulate an astronaut's weight inside the capsule. Later on, they experimented with primates. 
Before the primary launching test, the team put together a thorough protocol that stipulated what they theoretically should do if anything went awry. As Krantz explained in a book, quote, So many things are happening that they would not have any time for second thoughts or arguments. After the explosion of the Mercury Atlas I during the test launch, the team faced significant pressure. Project Mercury was over a year behind schedule, and its critics thought it wouldn't achieve its objective. One particularly scathing article in the journal Missiles and Rockets said, quote, NASA's Mercury Man satellite program appears to be plummeting the United States towards a new humiliating disaster in the East-West space race. It no longer offers any realistic hope of beating Russia in launching the first man into orbit, much less to serve as an early stepping stone for reaching the moon. The test launch of the MR-1 was meant to, quote, qualify the automatic in-flight abort sensing system and the spacecraft launch vehicle combination for the Mercury ballistic mission. The mission was supposed to achieve a speed of Mach 6 and successfully separate the booster from the capsule. In the beginning, the preparations for the launch of the MR-1 worked around the clock, and the test was actually ahead of schedule. However, upon closer examination, the engineers decided that the capsule needed internal reworking, which pushed back the launch day initially set on November 7, 1960. When the day finally arrived, everything was planned to the second. After the rocket launched, the engine would burn for two and a half minutes. Then the redstone would rise 130 miles in the air before falling back down. The team felt confident that nothing would go wrong during the 16-minute long mission. At 9 a.m. on November 21st, 1960, ignition occurred, and a blast was heard. For a brief moment, everything happened as expected. But then, the engineers looking through the periscope noticed that the booster was wobbling on its pedestal. The roar from the ignition stopped, and the engine shut down. The rocket rose four inches and settled back into the pad. Suddenly, the escape rocket jettisoned apart from the capsule, which was still attached from the booster. It flew 4,000 feet into the sky and crashed 400 yards away. The escape rocket was the only part to actually launch. The drogue, main, and reserve parachutes from the capsule deployed, and the radio antenna was ejected. Then everything stood still. Although the posigrade and retrograde motors didn't fire, which probably prevented the pad from exploding, a failed launch produced several threats. For example, the redstone was left unsecured on the pad, entirely fueled and powered up. The deployed parachutes from the capsule were dangerously hanging on the sides, at the risk of getting caught in the wind and tipping the capsule over. According to George Lowe, who reported the failure to NASA headquarters, quote, at the time of this writing, the booster destruct system is still armed and cannot be disarmed until the battery depletion during the morning of November 22nd. Capsule pyrotechnics, including posigrade and retrograde rockets, are also armed. Inside the control room, engineers were equally panicked and disappointed at the failure. One question was on everybody's mind. How should they manage a fully fueled rocket that could create great destruction. No immediate solution seemed viable. NASA engineer and flight director Chris Kraft refused the idea of shooting the booster's propellant tanks to depressurize them and instead decided to wait until the next day to act. After all, the rocket seemed to be in a relatively safe position. Kraft famously declared, quote, that is the first rule of flight control. If you don't know what to do, don't do anything. The morning after the failed launch, the battery on the booster's destruct system was discharged. The liquid oxygen had boiled off. It was finally safe for the crew to carefully approach the redstone 
drain the ethanol, and evaluate the rocket. Once in the site, the team discovered that the space capsule seemed in good condition, but the redstone's fins and skin had suffered damage. Over a thousand feet away, they found the launch escape tower buried in the sand. The MR-1 was sent to Huntsville for evaluation and refitting. A disaster had been averted, but an investigation was still pending on this demoralizing failure. In only two days, the reason behind the failure was determined. The MR-1 had malfunctioned because a power and a control cable disconnected at the wrong time. Located at the base of the MR-1, the control cable was supposed to detach first. However, because it was longer than expected, the power cable disconnected 29 milliseconds before. These connectors were responsible for control signals, electrical power, and grounding. The moment the power cable detached and stopped all electrical grounding, three amps of current flowed through the engine. This forced the redstone to shut off the engine and send a signal to jettison the launch escape tower. Although the capsule was supposed to separate from the booster after the launch escape tower jettisoned, this did not happen. In fact, because the capsule sensors felt its own supported weight, the separation from the booster was disabled. The launch escape tower also activated the parachute's recovery system, which deployed the drogue parachute first, followed by the main one. Because the capsule didn't elevate, and the main parachute didn't censor any weight, the reserve parachute was consequently deployed. Although demoralizing, the mission was crucial for Project Mercury's evolution. Over-preparation before the tests became natural for the team, who took their time to be ready for any possible situation that might arise. This was especially useful during the flight at the Freedom 7, the first one to include an astronaut. The team prepared the mission for six months before the launch. Eventually, the MR-1 was rescheduled for December of 1960, and the other Mercury Redstones wouldn't fly until 1961. This infamous launch vehicle was put on display at the Space Orientation Center of Marshall Space Flight Center. 20 Mercury Redstones, Atlas, and Little Joe launch vehicles were tested, none carrying astronauts. In the end, those rockets were discarded, and Project Mercury chose to work with a completely new launch vehicle, one not based on off-the-shelf technology. On April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human to journey into a single orbit. Three weeks later, American Alan Shepard reached suborbital flight. Failures like the four-inch flight of the MR-1 proved John F. Kennedy right when he said, quote, We choose to go to the moon this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Mm -hmm.